Before we get started, Cliff, would you mind praying for us this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have made, that you would allow us to rejoice and gladness. Help us with uh, teachable hearts and ears that are ready to receive your word with gladness. May we rejoice at the wonderful doctrines that you have. Bless Matt who speaks and teaches and uh, shares with us uh, the, the things that you've been teaching in the last week. Would you do so for our good and your glory in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. All right, so kind of follow the theme that's been going on in our church with Sunday School as Ryan and Cliff have been walking us through specific sins such as gossip, slander, anger, all these kind of specific sins in our lives. I kind of wanted to follow along with that theme, but I wanted to kind of bring it back to a doctrine where how do we battle these things? How do we come against these things? So I, I, I really got enraptured with the doctrine of sanctification. And actually, as I read up on it, I learned a lot. I, I was very edified doing this study because there was a lot that I never really put two and two together on. So it was really edifying for me. So my hope is that, I'll, that you guys will share in that and be able to learn some stuff as well. I mean, I guess I just got to stay one chapter ahead of you to teach you, I guess. So... Um, but yeah, uh, so when you think of the doctrine of sanctification, what first comes to mind? Holiness, yes. Anyone else want to elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. Transformed. Being set apart. Being set apart, yes, very good. Becoming more like Jesus, yes, absolutely. So it's, it's a growth, right? We always think of that progressive growth in sanctification. Um, actually, Joe really nailed it. Uh, so if we look at the word, the word in the Greek for the New Testament for sanctification, uh, actually, um, sorry, Titus's wife, I don't know your name, but she nailed it as well, that it's trans sometimes translated holiness. Uh, the Greek word, uh, the noun form of the verb to sanctify is to make holy. Uh, the basic meaning of the verb is to set apart that from which common or unclean and to consecrate unto God. The Hebrew counterpart is translated by this Greek word in the Septuagint is sometimes used of an inanimate objects. So for example, uh, the Old Testament we read of the holy mount on which the law was given to Moses, Mount Sinai, was sanctified in the sense that it was separated from common use and consecrated to God as the special place from which he gave the revelation of his law. We also have reference to holy buildings, vessels, utensils, and other things used in the tabernacle or in the temple. These things were separated from common use and devoted to God's service. In the case of these inanimate objects, they were separated from ceremonial defilement and uncleanliness and devoted to God. In the New Testament, when we apply this to Christians, uh, uh, when applied to Christians to be holy or to be sanctified, refers primarily to being set apart from sin and uncleanliness and devoted to God and righteousness. It is also used to refer to the attitude of heart and walk of life reflecting in the separation and devotion. So kind of like you guys mentioned, it's, it's holiness, it's being set apart. So from what was common use, like you said, a common mountain, a common utensil, common things were set apart by God for holy use. And when we apply this to the Christian life, it's the exact same thing. Common people set apart now for God's use. So that's what we kind of have in our minds now, thinking of sanctification. Now, when we think about this, we like to think of that progressive growth. When we think of sanctification, we, we kind of think of, how am I growing in holiness? How am I growing in sanctification? How am I growing towards God? How am I learning about God? But what I found is there's a, a major element that I personally didn't really think about in sanctification. Uh, if you can turn your Bibles to Romans 6, we'll go through verses 1 through 14 real quick, and I'll kind of show you this major element of sanctification that, like, th that I personally never really thought about.
And what we're going to find is, I think a lot of us may have grown up with a view of sanctification that's just common in our culture and it wasn't really fleshed out properly. So I'm going to hopefully show you what is the reformed view of sanctification. So let's start in Romans 6 verses 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that, he will, that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are now not under law, but under grace. So there's a couple major points just reading in this section. And if you get a chance, reread through this in your spare time and just underline and highlight some of these points. And it'll be unreal to you how much this is in here. Number one point, union with Christ. This is very important in the reformed view of sanctification is that unity, that union with Christ. So if we were to look at this, verse 3, baptized into Christ. Uh, verse 5, united with him in a death like his, we shall be certainly united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 6, our old self was crucified with him. Verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Verse 11, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you see this union with Christ is very prevalent and a very base foundation of this understanding of sanctification. And there's two kind of sub points that I would put to what does union, what is this union with Christ? Uh, what are the two points that are, we are united with Christ majorly in his death to sin and in his life in Christ. So if we look to death to sin, so same thing, let's just go through this verse two. How can we who died to sin, still live in it. So a question to pose to you, what does that mean to die to sin? And I think this is where a lot of people get confused. What does it mean? So just, and don't feel ashamed. What do you think it means to die to sin? Yes, Nate. Um, there's a story about a guy from the East. After he was converted, he was walking down the street and one of the prostitutes Along and and he didn't he walked right by mm -hmm. and he said it's it's not Augustine that Augustine has died mm -hmm. and it's kind of like that but because we recognize that we're they that dead to be mm -hmm. dead mm -hmm. that Augustine. Yes, very good. Anyone else? Read in Isaiah where it talks about what are those who call evil good and good and evil. Yeah, Isaiah. Mm -hmm. like, I think it's great. Like, there's some of this Wesleyan idea where you won't sin anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't, well, I can't do that. Yeah. Sorry. Did you and, no, no, you're actually going on a really good path here. I'm right, actually going to talk about that. But, you know. Yes. The fact that I no longer delight in sin anymore. Mm -hmm. And when you sin, you realize it's evil. Yes. Actually, no, no, you're actually on a real good point. I'm going to touch on that later on. So thank you very much. 
So the, the death to sin, kind of like Nathan and Josh, like they're very, very close. The idea of death to sin means death to the dominion of sin. It is no longer holding that pull. I've always loved this analogy when you think about the sin nature. I've heard, I can't remember who it was. I think it was James White used this analogy and I love this. If you have a vulture and you place this vulture in a room and you have a pile of rotting meat in one corner and a pile of vegetables and carrots and stuff in the other corner, what's the vulture going to go after? It's going to go after the meat. It can go and eat carrots and vegetables, but by its nature, it's not going to. Whereas now, when you're free from that, that dominion of sin, you now have the freedom to choose against it. You now have the freedom to fight against it. You have the freedom to say no. Like, and Josh said this, like, yeah, we're going to touch on the, the delight, delighting in sin later on. But now it, it no longer has dominion over you. So if you look in verse 6 here, our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 9, death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin. So this isn't an idea that the way Christ died to sin is not is the same that we have died to sin. So that's why when people say, oh, that we've died to this ability to sin or we've died to the... No, Christ never sinned. The dominion over him, that temptation over him, is no longer there. The dominion is gone. But he, the life he lives, he lives to God. Let therefore sin not reign in your mortal body, verse 12. Make you obey its passions. Verse 13 continues this exact same line of thinking. In verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you. It's not a perfectionism. That's one major clear thing. Don't think of it as, I've died to sin, so why do I still struggle? Why do I still fall? You've died to the dominion of sin. We'll go through the confession here real quick as well later on, and I'll show the way it's worded is a wonderful way to think of this. But moving on to my next sub-point, life in Christ. So now we've died, with, we've died to sin. It has no more dominion over us. Now we have life in Christ. Verse 5, we're united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Verse 10. The death he died. He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Are you starting to see that union with Christ? Message, that language coming through? And you're starting to see it that it's you're united in his death, kind of like... Like Nathan said, putting off that old self, the old Augustine, it's gone. You're united in Christ in that death, that it's gone. You're a new creation. But now you're alive in Christ as he is alive. That's what that big, that big motion, that big uh, important point of union with Christ is. And this was the one that really hammered home. The second major point I want you to take away in this 14 verses is consider this. This is very important in the last three verses here. So this is uh, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So I guess four verses, sorry. Being united to Christ is very important in the Reformed view. Um, but yeah, so as we can see this, the last point here is to consider ourselves. Now, I got to be really careful. This is not a power of positive thought thing I'm going to talk to you about. This is not the law of attraction. This isn't you saying, oh, I'm going to say this enough and, and it's going to change the... No, what Paul is saying here is this is the reality of a Christian believer. And he's asking you to live in a way that is in line with this. Kind of that in step with the gospel language that he's used in other verses. So think of it that way. Don't think of it as... Like I said, it's not a power of positive thought that you're going to wake up and say, I'm united to Christ and I'm going to, and I'm going to, it's not that kind of idea. What Paul is kind of saying here is, this is the reality. Now walk in this, walk in this way. And yes, Blake. Mm-hmm. As a living sacrifice on the altar, like all the bunch of 
one off. Yeah. Right? And so it's, it's, it's telling us to consider the difference between the reality of the world and the reality of the lost life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing is, it's really important, is the Greek word here is logizomai. It's, it's the word that we would use for the root word of logic. This isn't a, like I said, this isn't a power of positive thought. This isn't you proclaiming, declaring something. What Paul is saying here is this is a logical, reasoned conclusion for your union with Christ where you should be living in. So when he says consider this, Reckon this to yourselves, it says in the King James Version. He's saying, this is the reality. Now walk in this. But now the question now, because we say this, is how do we walk in this? And actually, before I move on to, to that, the way to think of this is, think of the way that you have faith in Christ. Because remember, in Romans, faith in Christ is a very major theme throughout the book of Romans. Faith in Christ. You have faith in Christ on the day of judgment that you will point to him and not your own merit, correct? What Paul is issuing here is have that same faith that you've been united to Christ so that how Christ has died to sin, how he lives now, you are united in that. Have that same assurance, that same faith, that same trust in him in that same way. If that's, the, if that's one way I would say to put it, think of it that way is that just as he's going, just as you have that assurance, that faith in him, that he is at the right hand of the Father, that he is the mediator, that he is going to be that perfect sac uh, sacrifice that we can point to on the day of judgment, have that same assurance in this. So when you live out your Christian life now, so now we're, so there's this, what we would call a definitive sanctification in this chunk of scripture. That's the first element, is that a, de a definite sanctification. Think of the words that, you know, think of some words. Can anyone think of words that um, in the scriptures that it says that how, how they portray Christians? Like, for, for example, we're a royal priesthood or a new creation. Is there any other words that come to mind? Saints, yes. Yes. Have you put on Christ? Yes. So, or... Yeah, put off the old man. Exactly. So you see that, that like, this language is used that you've been set apart. You are holy. You are, but we don't feel that way. We don't feel like saints. We don't feel holy all the time. We struggle with sin. We battle with it. Well, this is where the progressive element comes in. So if you would turn to me to Romans 7, just one chapter over. Now, I know before I kind of get into this, there's a, big, uh, there's a big debate here on the wretched man passage. So sorry, we'll be Romans 7, 14 through 25. There's a big debate. Is Paul talking about unbelievers through an unbelieving mindset? Or is he talking from a believer's mindset? Yeah, like some people would say he's speaking when he says that whole thing about, oh, wretched man that I am. Is he speaking as an unbeliever or as a believer? There's actually a big debate on it. I, if you have an ESV study Bible, it actually, the footnotes, it has a great section where it kind of lays them both out. I, but even the ESV study Bible, and I would agree, says he's speaking as a believer. And there's two major verses before we read this that I just want to, why I believe this. Number one is verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not, for I do, not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Unbelievers don't hate their sin. I, I think that's a very clear cut thing. Yes, Nathan. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. Mm -hmm. For they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Mm -hmm. So there's a battle. Yep. And actually, the presence of the battle is an indication that there's a new principle at work. Absolutely. And actually, I'm going to bust a lot of sanctification, I think. As I understand it, it's something of an identity and recognition that there's desires that are conflicting. Mm -hmm. And we need to recognize that there's desires given to us now by God. And we need to, as it were, give in to those desires mm -hmm. and accept 
Yes, absolutely. And yeah, like kind of like you were saying, Nathan, the other verse that I would say in this wretched man passage, which I'll read real quick here afterwards, in verse 22, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. When's the last time you've heard a new Christian or an unbeliever say those words, that they delight in the law of God? Probably not. So uh, Romans 7, verse 14 through 25. I'll just read this real quick. And I want you to just listen. I think personally, the way I look at this is Paul is talking about this definitive act of sanctification being united to Christ. But now he's trying to show what does it look like living the everyday Christian life? And just listen to the turmoil that that battle, like Nathan was talking about, that battle, that struggle. Just listen to the words here. So starting in verse, uh, uh, sorry, 14. Um, right here. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but that sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I want, or if I, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that is when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of the God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So you can see this inner turmoil that he's going through. And even like he said, the, the biggest thing I would say is, he, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this? This isn't a pull up your bootstraps and try harder. This isn't a, here's 10 points to fight anger and here's how to stop yelling at your kids and here's how to stop lusting and here's how, that, that's not gonna work if we try and put it on ourselves. Without that union with Christ, without that reality set in our hearts, without that true sanctifying work that he has done, this is a battle we're going to lose. And that's why, uh, the uh, why some people would use the, word, the term definitive sanctification as opposed to positional. So if you think of it this way, with justification, it's a position thing. You are, it's a positional thing, whereas sanctification, it's a reality. You have been sanctified by God. Now grow in that. That's a reality. It's not a, it's not a positional change. It's not just some, it, it's a reality. You've had a change of heart. You've had a change of desires, as Nathan was saying. So that's the big major thing. And I think many of us, so the more I looked into this as well, I started to see this two-tier view, as Josh kind of mentioned with Wesleyan. This is where it kind of, I'd say it was like the start of this. And there was a lot of branches that came out of it. So I don't want to like just lump it all together and say it's bad. But I think this is kind of the view that a lot of people think of in our society today. So they would understand sanctification in a two-tier kind of way. At that first point, when you become a new believer, you would have what they would call their first work of grace. And you're kind of this embattled or defeated Christian life where sin is still there. It's still battling you. You're still prevailing. It's still there. So they would say like, yeah, you've come to Christ, but you're going to have this defeated Christian life almost. And then what would happen is there would be a second work of grace where you have 100% victory over sin. And almost you should have this mentality that sin shouldn't even be a problem in your life. And that's what a lot of people would think of. So an example of this would be, and I'm, and I'm not trying to, to pick on this, this just, I think this is a very easy example that many would understand is Pentecostals would say that that baptism by the Holy Spirit, which evidenced by tongues, that would be that second act of grace that would happen. And so when that moment happened, there, I'm, I'm a victorious Christian. Sin shouldn't even be up. I shouldn't even have a, a problem with sin anymore because I've had that second act of grace. But I think that's the problem is when we think of sanctification in that way, 
it, 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 it kind of starts to flesh out in our everyday Christian walk. If you think about it, I'm not, and like I say, I'm not picking on Pentecostals, but a lot of people that would hold this view, that's why they're chasing an experience with God. You see them chasing a very spiritual high or they need to, they need to almost redo that second act of grace to kind of confirm that it's in their heart, that that really happened. And I'm, no, I shouldn't struggle with sin. And I got to put on the happy face and I can't tell people that I'm struggling with sin because I, 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 I have a victory over it and it, it becomes dangerous. Because then people have to start asking, if I'm victorious over sin, how come I still struggle with it? Yes? Yes. Yes. It's almost kind of a baptistic way of chasing, if not experiences, it's just like one of the road things, mm -hmm. which are not bad. However, it's still works based rather mm -hmm. than reckoning ourselves to the united to Christ. And so I'm going to plug it while it's recording with the Cleo cap. Yeah. And it's constantly reminding us of the gospel. And some of the pitfalls, not just the Pentecostal, but even just general evangelicalism is that often we're not that much different mm -hmm. uh, from the miracles. There's yeah. still seems to be something other than mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Theocast, if you do get a chance, they're wonderful guys, wonderful podcast to listen to. And yes, but yeah, like kind of like Ryan said, this isn't, like I said, I'm not, the only reason I use Pentecostal is because of that very specific example of that second work of grace. But I would say, kind of like Ryan said, evangelicalism would be a very good way to, would say, would kind of almost have this. Even if this doctrine wasn't fleshed out, you can see them, you can really see them acting in this way. You can see them really being like, living their Christian walk in this way. But yeah, so if I, if, but if I'm victorious, so I've had that second act of grace, how can I struggle with sin? How can I be even sad or struggle with depression or struggle with anger or struggle with lust? or How can I have these things a part of my life? And I think that's where the reform view drastically, drastically goes away from that. So, um, I'm just going to read the, the confession, the 1689 confession. Uh, it's very quick. They have three paragraphs on sanctification. And I just want you to remember all our points, that union with Christ, that death to sin, that life in Christ. And then also the progressive element. We'll hear this really quick here. Paragraph one, those who are united to Christ and effectually called and regenerated have a new heart and a new spirit created within them. Uh, through the power of Christ's death and resurrection. So you see that union with Christ, that you have been sanctified. It's a definitive thing through his death and resurrection. But then comes that progressive element. They are also further sanctified, really and personally. So this isn't a, like I said, not a power positive thought. This is a very real thing. They're really and personally through the same power by his word and spirit dwelling within them. In the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed. So remember, it's not that you're just never going to sin again. The dominion, that hold it has on you is destroyed. And the various evil desires that arise from it are more and more weakened and put to death. At the same time, those called and regenerated are more and more enlivened and strengthened in all saving graces so that they practice true holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So you can see that there is that progressive element that, they, that we recognize you're going to have this war against sin. And in paragraph two, they kind of expand upon it. This sanctification extends throughout the whole person, though it is never completed in this life. I'm, I, I'm not trying to throw eschatology into something, but I was talking with Ryan about this yesterday. It's that same idea of the already but not yet. You're already sanctified in Christ. You're already united with him, but not fully. So th th that's a way to think about it. If you kind of have that idea with uh, eschatology, that already but not yet, it's very similar idea with this. So the sanctification extends throughout the whole person, though it is never completed in this life. Some corruption remains in every part. From this arises a continual, continual and irreconcilable war with the desires of the flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, just like Nathan was talking about that. 
that war against the spirit, that war against the flesh, they're going to be constantly battling. You think you got one sin beat and then all of a sudden another one arises in your life. It's this, it's this tension you're always going to face. And it's, it's there. But now the question is, so if this tension is always there, there's always this waging war happening, how do we, how do we get into the fight? What do we do if this is a reality, if that struggle with sin is there? And that's where I'd come to another point here is, how are we sanctified? The third paragraph of the catechism kind of touched on this, but there was, or sorry, the uh, third paragraph of the confession, but there's a, a catechism me and Tiff have been using, it's Keech's catechism. And the one question here, 93, what are the outward means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption? Very fancy old English way of saying, how, do we, how does Christ communicate to us the benefits of redemption? How does he talk to us? How do we grow in this? How do we learn in this? Answer, the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, baptism, the Lord's supper, and prayer, all which means are made effectual to the elect for salvation. And then question 101 later kind of, clarif kind of builds on that baptism part. What is the duty of such who are rightly baptized? Question 101. It is the duty of such who are rightly baptized to give up themselves to some particular and orderly church of Jesus Christ, that they may walk in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. So they're not flashy. They're not fancy. They're outward, ordinary means. Baptism, God's word, partaking of the sacraments, Lord's Supper, prayer, being here, being in this church, that's how you fight. That is the base foundation of how you fight, how you get involved in this war. It's not flashy. It's not fireworks going off. And I shared this uh, example at the men's breakfast when we were talking about family worship. Because, you know, you feel defeated when you're trying to talk to your kids and it's not going well. And you're like, Holy cow, I can't do another family worship like that. But I heard this example and I really liked it. Is when we think of food, it's a means to our health. It's how we keep healthy. It's how we keep strong. We eat food. How many of us can remember what we had for dinner 11 days ago? You know, seven days ago? None of us. But we ate. We're still here. We're, we, we kept healthy. We kept alive. So we ate. It sustained us. It's the same way with God's word. The same way with prayer. It's the same. You're not going to have fireworks and this incredible religious experience every time. There's some sermons, some books. Sometimes I'm in the word, some prayer times that are amazing. And it's the same thing with food. Sometimes you have that meal that you know what you're like, I remember my me that meal. I remember that Christmas dinner with that. I remember the first time that family invited us over and we had this wonderful... There's certain things that do stick out to you. There's certain times in scripture you'll hear a sermon and you can't read the passage in the Bible without thinking about it. But a lot of times, you're reading your word in faith. You're praying in faith. And it's to sustain you. It's that daily bread. It's to get you by. You might not remember it. It might not be flashy. But it is the biggest way to do this. And also, here's another kind of question. How many people have talked to, have had people in their lives walk away from the church? Like, I, I've known friends that grew up in Christian homes, grown this. Now, how many of you would say, if you were to go to them, why they walked away from, when they were like, oh, I'm kind of, I'm walking away from the church. How many of them were constantly reading their Bible, praying, and still attending church? Probably you saw that less and less. And I think that's a big reason is as soon as those ordinary means of grace start to go, it starts to starve that Christian. And the next thing you know, they don't want anything to do with Christ. It's those very ordinary, everyday things in faith that we do. It may, like I said, it, we, sometimes we read in scripture and we read about Pentecost and we read about the conversion of Paul and we're like, this is glorious and the God's light and he was blinded and da 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 da. That, that's not it every day. It's the ordinary means of grace. They're every day just ordinary means that God has given us. And that's where the biggest 
deviation would happen from us and evangelicalism in a sense. Whereas they're saying, you know, go to a, a, an incredible worship service, go see this, this exact speaker, go do this, go put in this program, put your work into this book, do this, do this. The reform view would say, you're struggling in the Christian life, use the means. Use those means. Pray, read your word, partake of the Lord's table, go to church, fellowship with the saints, talk about, bear one another's burdens, share in each other's joys. That's the way to, that's the way to get into this fight. Paragraph three of the confession. In this war, the remaining corruption may greatly prevail for a time. Yet, through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part overcomes. So the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. They pursue a heavenly life in the gospel in gospel ordinance to all the commands that Christ as head and king has given them in his word. Just remember those words, the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying work of Christ and it's effectual, the regenerate heart overcomes. You may battle with sin for years. And I, I, I couldn't figure out the saying. I was trying to talk to Ryan about it yesterday, and I couldn't remember the saying, but it's, it's this old saying. Maybe someone here knows it, where it's, I don't like where I am, I don't like who I am, but I thank God that I'm not what I used to be. I know for myself there's things that I've struggled with in my life, but I look back 10 years ago and I go, thank the Lord I'm not at that point. It still may have that little niggling part of me. But boy, I'm so glad of what Christ has done over these 10 years. So, the three major points I want you to walk away from this today. Number one, remember your union with Christ. Remember your death to sin. Remember your life in Christ. Remember your baptism but remember your union with Christ and consider that, logically remember that, live in a way that Christ has died to sin, so have you because you're united to Christ. And Christ now lives and you live in Christ because you are united to Christ. Point number two, letting that be the foundation, let that be the foundation of your progressive sanctification. Sin does not hold dominion over you. You are now free to say no and to mortify it. And number three, the best way to do this is the ordinary outward means of grace. So that you, saint, may grow in grace, perfecting in holiness, in the fear of God, to help you pursue a heavenly life in gospel obedience to all the commands that Christ, as head and king, has given. Remember those and live in that. I know for myself, that's where I really had to come to the point of being like, I don't think I really ever considered that proper. I don't think I ever truly had that faith of, I can say no to sin because Christ, I'm united to him because of what he has done. So that's what the major three points I would take away. Is there any questions before we close up in prayer? Any questions or even comments, stories? Yes, Henry. Fighting sin. Number one, we are sheep. We can't. Mm -hmm. we got to call on the chest. Mm -hmm. uh, I always like the analogy of darkness. It makes it more light to have the light like this. So mm -hmm. I see this analogy with uh, with the dancing cord with the light bulb at the end. Got the negative, put it in the water, five inches apart, put salt in there. The more salt you put in there, salt and light. Mm -hmm. The brighter the light gets. Mm -hmm. The more dark it gets. Absolutely. For sure. And we want to be free of darkness. We can't be free with the little man in the body. Mm -hmm. Christ, but with the word of God. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Yes, Joe. I have a quote that I uh, read a while ago on sanctification that kind of stuck with me. Mm -hmm. It is that. Uh, Justification ensures our glorification, and uh, sanctification is our goal to travel between the two. Amen. Absolutely. Yep. No, that's absolutely true. 
Anyone else? All right. Nathan, would you mind closing us with a word of prayer? Absolutely. Father in heaven, we pray that these opening up the word with regard to our identity and our calling and the grace that you have shown to us, not merely in not only in announcing us righteous in Christ, but also giving us the power to live in a way that conforms to that. I pray, Father, that the love of Christ would sustain us, motivate us more powerfully in us through your spirit. That your spirit would um, be poured out richly in that we would walk in that spirit, seeing that we have been made alive in the spirit. And I pray that we would every day strengthen our members with the instrument of prayer. That on the last day, our lives would be sung in praise and the glory of Son, Father, and Holy Spirit. So, mm -hmm. Pray, Lord, that. What has been planted here would not merely uh, rest in the ground, but that it would bring fruit. Really take root and grow in us, and that every day we would grow in holiness and love to you and to the world. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone.